Beatrice pulled her arms overhead in a stretch. She wondered if all brides felt like this when they returned from their honeymoons. Flush with a warm, relaxed pleasure. Except that Beatrice, Her Majesty Beatrice Georgina Frederica Louise, Queen of America, wasn't a normal bride. Actually, since she hadn't gotten married, she wasn't a bride at all. She glanced at Theodore Eaton, the man she was supposed to have wed earlier this year. His hair was an even brighter blonde after three weeks in the Caribbean sun, his skin burnished to a golden tan. Beatrice knew she looked just as relaxed and well-rested. Not that it would last, with everything that lay ahead. In the weeks following their non-wedding, Beatrice had remained in the capital, dealing with the aftermath of her decision. She had reviewed infrastructure bills and ambassadorial appointments, and had studied foreign legislation and trade policies in preparation for the upcoming League of Kings conference. It was all the tedious, unglamorous work of being a monarch. The work Beatrice should have been doing since her father died, if she hadn't allowed herself to be sidetracked with planning her wedding. Porcelain platters were scattered on the table before her and Teddy, laden with the remnants of their scrambled eggs and fruit. Franklin, the golden lab puppy that she and Teddy had adopted together, not a puppy much longer, nuzzled her leg whining. Beatrice surreptitiously broke off a piece of toast and passed it to him under the table. Glad to be back, Teddy asked. Beatrice leaned down to rub Franklin's velvety soft ears. Glad to see this guy again, she said inside. Though, I have to say, I already miss our bungalow. Beatrice had never really been on a vacation before. She'd traveled all over the world, but always for a diplomatic visit or state business. Even on family trips, she'd been too busy skiing or sailing or catching up on school assignments to relax. It was a trait she'd inherited from her father. King George IV had never taken a day off work in his life. And now that he was gone, Beatrice wished that he had. A knock sounded at the door. Yes, Beatrice called out. Your Majesty, the footman announced. The Lady Chamberlain is here to see you. Surprised, Beatrice checked her watch, a platinum one that her father had given her on her 18th birthday, its hands starred with tiny diamonds. It wasn't like her to be running late. She'd gotten too accustomed to island time, all those mornings when she and Teddy had lingered over breakfast, only to end up falling into bed again afterward. Beatrice glanced at the footman, struck with an idea. Why don't you tell Anju to come on in? Into the breakfast room, your majesty? Why not? Beatrice's relationship with her former chamberlain, Robert Standish, had been stiff with formality. But beneath the incessant bowing and your majestying, Robert hadn't respected her at all. He'd been silently undermining Beatrice's authority, trying to keep her from exerting any real power. Robert had been far too stuffy and old-fashioned to even consider sitting down in the Washington family's private breakfast room, which was precisely why Beatrice had suggested it. She was determined to do things differently this time around. B, Teddy cleared his throat. Do you think you could run some of my thoughts past Anju? See if we can get moving on any of them? She nodded. Of course. America had never had a king consort before. The only real precedents for Teddy's position were the 11 queens consort who'd come before him. Most recently, Beatrice's mother, Queen Adelaide. So Teddy had drawn up some ideas for responsibilities he could take on. He'd been trained as a future duke, after all. He had a great deal of experience in allocating budget, looking out for the good of his people. Beatrice knew he wouldn't be happy doing what queens consort traditionally did, cutting ribbons, arranging tablescapes. Of course, it wasn't fair that the queens had been limited to domestic roles in the first place. Beatrice's mother was one of the smartest people she knew. And like Teddy, Adelaide had been trained to rule a duchy someday. Two duchies, in fact. But once she'd married King George, she'd been relegated to a position that was more ceremonial than political. That was just the way the monarchy worked. Until now.